In his book, Think and Grow Rich, I don't know if you've heard of it, by Napoleon Hill, he tells the story of a prospector. Now, this prospector for months and months had been out prospecting for gold, digging for the mother load, hoping to find the riches that he had longed for. He would get up early in the morning and he would search and he would work hard. He would do everything he could in pursuit of his fortune. He dug and he dug. He would find gold here. He would find gold there, but never hit the mother load. Finally, wearied from years of searching, the prospector finally gave up. Exasperated, he sold his tools for whatever money he could get. Now the new prospector to whom he sold his tools called in a geologist, a land surveyor, surveyor and, and an engineer. Upon further study, they surmised the location of the mother load and they began to dig. They began to dig in the very spot where the previous prospector had been digging. And they dug one foot and then two feet, finally three feet, and they hit the mother load. The old prospector had given up three feet away from striking it rich. If only he had persevered, if only he had, struck, had stuck it out, then perhaps he would have received the riches that were right there. Well, this morning we're talking about persevering in prayer. And sometimes that's the concept we get about prayer, isn't it? If we just press through, if we just persevere, if we just keep on digging, we will hit the mother load. We think if we keep working, we keep praying, we'll finally strike it rich. And if we give up too soon, well, we might miss out. We, can, we come to think of prayer as a way to try to convince a reluctant God that we're serious about this. We're serious about this prayer thing, God, and we're going to stick to it. And we hope that God will eventually look down and say, look how serious those guys are. They, they mean it. And then God will say, you know what? I'm going to do this for you. The problem is that's not faith. That's manipulation. You know, we sit there shouting, God, look at me, look at me, look at me. And, and, and we figure that eventually God's going to look at us and respond hoping that somehow we can persuade or manipulate God to do the very thing that we long for. If only God knew how sincere we were, if only God knew how serious we were, then maybe he would respond, maybe he would answer our prayers. You know, it really verges on the repetitious prayers that Jesus speaks of in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Now I understand it in the context of what they're speaking of is, is more along the incantations of pagan worship. But there's this idea that if we keep saying words again and again and again, that somehow, somehow God will respond and our prayer life needs to be marked by this repetition. And I think this idea of repetition and persevering in that sense comes from really some misunderstandings of a couple of passages. If you have your Bibles, turn with me in your, in your Bible to Luke chapter 18. If you uh, did not bring your Bible, there's a Bible, Bible in the pew in front of you. It's on page 1038 in there, 1038. But here in Luke chapter 18. Beginning at verse 1, it says, Then Jesus told his, his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, as we look at this passage, it's helpful, it's helpful that, look, 
Luke gives us a purpose statement. He gives it right there at the very beginning. What does he say? He says, Jesus told his disciples a parable. Why? To show them that they should always pray and not give up. So we have this instruction. Always pray and don't give up. But does this mean that we are to keep asking again and again and again and again? The example Jesus gives in this parable is the example of an unjust judge. This unjust judge who could care less about God, could care less about other people, who reluctantly acquiesces to the constant nagging of a persistent widow. Now there are some problems that occur when you begin to compare an unjust God, judge to God. So we're going to look at some, some of those differences in this passage. If the, first pass, uh, the first difference is this, God is just, he's not unjust. In Psalm 25, verse 8, it says, God is good and upright. In other words, God is a just God. And what's it mean to be a just God is that God is guided by truth. He is guided by reason. He is guided by fairness. God makes good choices. He is not like the unjust God who is unfair, who is untruthful, who is unreasonable, but rather he is just. He does the right things. The unjust judge, on the other hand, he's not known for doing what is right. For that reason, Jesus asked, will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? So in comparison to the unjust God who does it and acquiesces because of the nagging, God says, I will bring about what is right for my chosen people. The second difference is this. God is willing, not reluctant. The widow had to knock and knock and knock, trying to get the unjust judge's attention. The judge really didn't want to do anything. He he was like, leave me alone, right? He didn't care. He wasn't concerned. He was reluctant to accommodate, except for the fact that if he didn't, she'd come and get him. So he finally agrees and, and opens the door. Now, here's what it says in Matthew 7. We read it just a little bit ago. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek. And you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. Do you hear that? Knock, and the door will be open to you. If you knock, God will open the door to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. God is willing to answer our prayers if we ask, if we seek, if we knock. Third difference is this. God is quick to answer. Not to put you off. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 in chapter 18, what's it say there? It says, will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice. And quickly. That's the key there. And quickly. God is not a God who's going to keep putting you off. He says he will do it quickly. But unfortunately, I think we can all attest to this. It doesn't always come as quick as we hope, right? Right? To answer our complaint regarding God's timing, we need to consider the context. The context of this passage, the passage here in Luke 18, it exists in a bigger dialogue that Jesus had having regarding the coming of the kingdom of God. There was a longing for the Messiah to come to establish his rule so that he would have authority, authority over those who had oppressed the Jewish people, authority over all of the difficulties and trials and the tribulations that the people would experience. And so in this context, they talk about the return of the Lord. And in that context, in chapter 17, Jesus is talking about his imminent return. He will come like the flash of light, lightning in the night. And then he says, keep on praying and never give up. The point is this, in this context, what Jesus is saying is that you must continue to pray. Don't give up because there is a day that the Messiah will come and justice will be established on the earth. Until then, keep on praying and don't give up. Keep on praying for the Lord's return. Keep on pressing on in your Christian faith. Keep on pursuing the things of God. Don't lose heart. Don't lose sight of God's purpose and his plans. Wait for his return. This passage isn't about nagging God, but rather about continuing to trust God, to daily trust in his justice, his willingness, and his active involvement in your life. Let's turn back a few pages to another passage. You're in the book of Luke right now, so turn back to 
Luke 11. That's page 1029 in the Pew Bible. Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 5. There it says, Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of your friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers... If your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Or if you then, you who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Again, we get this picture of someone coming to the door, this time at midnight. They got a lot of nerve, don't they? And it says, because, not because of friendship, but rather because of your shameless audacity. You know, this passage doesn't refer to an unjust judge, rather it refers to a reluctant friend. And like the previous passages, again, we have to raise the question, are we comparing God to the reluctant friend? Is it a contrast or a comparison? That's the question you have to ask. And, and I think in this case, again, it's a contrast. It's not a comparison. We're not comparing God to this person, but we're contrasting God with this person. So there are some more differences. This time, the first difference is this. God doesn't sleep. Where, were, where was the friend in this situation? He and his children, they were in bed. They'd gone to bed. They had gone to sleep. It says so right there in verse 7. Now in Psalm 121, verses 3 and 4, what does it say? It says that God does not sleep, God does not slumber. He is constantly watching over you. God knows your needs, God knows where you're at, God knows what has come into your situation. He is not caught off guard, He's like, oh, what? How'd that happen? No, God is aware, God is attentive to your needs. He knows your needs even before your asks. In contrast to what Bob Dylan said, there is no need to knock, knock, knock on heaven's door. The second difference is this. God doesn't lock the door. Here, when he comes, the door is locked. The reluctant friend locked the door from the, to keep his friends on the outside, to keep others on the outside. What does Jesus say, though? He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When he calls his disciples, he says, come, follow me. At the death of Lazarus, he says, come, get up. God doesn't lock us out, but he constantly gives us this invitation to come, to be with him. In Luke 11, Jesus says, knock, and the door will be opened to you. When we pray, we're never locked out from God. This idea is further developed for us in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When Jesus died on the cross, it said that at that very moment that the, 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 the curtain the, the, that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies, and that, that holy place that was separated from us, except for the high priest who could go in once a year to offer his sacrifices. In the presence of God, the presence of God was said to come down into the Holy of Holy places. It says when Jesus died on the cross, that that curtain was rent, was torn in two from top to bottom. Because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross, we have access, as it says here in Hebrews 4, that we can approach the throne of God. We have access into the presence of God. God is not a God who is far off. God is a God who is near. He is not distance keeping us at arm's length. He says, come to me. We can confidently approach the throne of God where we receive mercy and we find grace to help us in our time of need. So we are not related to a God who locks the door. 
The third difference is this. God isn't motivated by your audacity. Now, if you were here last week, maybe you listened to the sermon online. Either way, you know that the title of last week's sermon was Audacious Prayer. Forget everything I said. Okay, not, not completely. Don't, don't throw it all out. But here's what I mean. You know, it sounds like I'm contradicting last week's message. Message After all, there was this, this idea that here that the reluctant friend's motivated by this friend's audacious or shameless audacity, right? So, though the reluctant friend stands in contrast to God rather than in comparison to God, so God is not motivated by our shameless audacity, it says, because the first friend was audacious to come to his door at midnight, the reluctant friend gave up. He wasn't motivated by friendship, but rather by this audacity, right? So God, on the other hand, is motivated by friendship. That is God's motivation. He's not motivated because of our audacity, but because of the relationship that he desires to have with us. We have been adopted as children. So we can come into the presence of God. We aren't the orphan who is sitting at the door begging for food, hoping that something will be given to us. We aren't the slave who is hoping that somehow the master will give us something just to survive another day. It's out of his relationship for us that God wants to bless us and longs to answer our prayers. In verses 11 through 13 in this passage, what does he say? It says, which of your fathers, if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Or if, he, if, you, if the child asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? The idea is that a, God, a father knows how to give good gifts. It's part of the relationship that you have. Out of love, not obligation, God answers our prayers. God is never obligated to answer your prayers because of their audacity. The gift of the Holy Spirit, it says in this context, what's it say? How much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The prayer is to receive the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot we could say about that, but for now what we're, we're looking at is the gift of the Holy Spirit in the sense of the presence of God's dwelling among you. Again, God is not a God who sleeps. God is a God who lives with inside the believer in the person of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is God's presence right there in that moment. Jesus told his disciples he would not leave them as orphans, you know, begging for food, but rather that he would send his Holy Spirit, a comforter, a helper to us. Through the Spirit, we are connected in intimate, personal relationship with the Father. It's out of this love-based, not obligation-based relationship that God answers our prayers. Now, just a, a quick aside to remind you that it's okay to, a pray, to pray audacious prayers. It's not the sense that we're trying to annoy God with our audacity, right? That is not the purpose of our audaciousness. But it's rather from a world's perspective, as they look at us pray, they should look at us and say, I can't believe you prayed for that. You prayed for this person's healing. You prayed for this person to be delivered from evil. You pray, the world should look at us and say, my goodness, would you look at the prayers of those people? How could you possibly pray for that? I'm, really? Yes. Why? Because God loves you and desires to answer your prayer. Because my Father in heaven loves me. He wants me to pursue his purposes. And when we pray according to his will and not our own, because we are in the context of a relationship, we can pray audaciously. Now, if you've tracked with me to this point, you should be sensing a question rising in your spirit. It might sound something like this. So if we're not to keep on knocking, if we're not to keep on asking, then why should we persevere in prayer? If we're not to keep on knocking, if we're not to keep on asking, because those were bad examples, right? That was the picture of what it looks like to be the reluctant friend or the unjust judge. That's how they got their answer. So, if we're not to do that, why should we persevere in prayer? So here are some reasons why we should persevere. First, perseverance develops faith. Let's look at another passage. Turn over to Matthew 15. 
Again, turning to the left in your Bibles from the book of Luke, back to Matthew chapter 15. That's page 971 in the Pew Bible. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 22. Here's what it says. There was a Canaanite woman from that vicinity who came to to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Then in verse 25, we get kind of a picture of this repetitive prayer because what happens, the woman, in verse 25, the woman came up and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. Now, verse 23, what did it say in verse 23? Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. You're hearing what the disciples are saying, right? It's like, just leave us alone, lady. Why do you keep coming after us and repeating to the point that they got annoyed because she kept asking and asking and asking? It says, Jesus, send her away because she's bothering us. It's one of those moments where you just shake your head at the disciples and go, really? I think often we'd probably be in the same situation. Just leave us alone. I need my space. Finally, in verse 28, what is Jesus' response to the audaciousness of this woman? Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And at that moment, at that moment, remember, God is not a God who delays, but a God who is quick to answer our prayers. At that moment, it says, her daughter was healed. But it's a great example of what perseverance in prayer is supposed to look like. It's not this position of saying, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's really not it is. It's, Lord, help me, help me, help me. This woman's faith was not in the repetition, in the perseverance, in the continuing repeating of words, but it was in Jesus. She recognized her own shortcomings, and she turned to the only place, to the only person that she could. She came to Jesus, and she came to him again and again and again, because there was nowhere else to turn. You know, I I share with this often, but it again comes back to the saying of in our lives we want to say the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. But we can't. Jesus can. And we want to solve the solutions on our problems on our own and come up with our own solutions. And we try to manipulate God thinking that that's one of our solutions. If we just keep saying, God, look at me, look at me, look at me, then he'll say, okay, but that's not what he says. We have to look to God because there's nowhere else to look. Lord, help me, help me, help me. Perseverance develops our faith because it brings our eyes back to Jesus, the only one who can, the only one in whom our faith should be focused. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Perseverance also develops maturity. You know, it's the immature child right in the car that says, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's the mature person who says, we'll get there when we get there. Now, not the dad in the front saying, we'll get there when we get there. But the person who says, you know what, there's a journey here. It's a process. I think of the disciples in the boat when Jesus says, we will go to the other side. And the storm comes and Jesus is asleep. And the disciples, we could have drowned. Jesus stands up and he rebukes the storm and they get to the other side because Jesus will get you to the other side. Andrew Murray, great prayer warrior, said this, our great danger in this school of the answer delayed is the temptation to think that, after all, it may not be God's will to give us what we ask. Okay, let that sink in just a little bit because that's important. Because we get to this place where we ask and we ask and we think, well, maybe God's not answering because I have not asked rightly. If I haven't heard a prayer, then we begin to think, well, perhaps it's because it's not God's will. 
And he says, if our prayer be according to God's word and under the leading of the spirit, let us not give way to these fears. Again, we talked about this last week. You have to listen to God in prayer. It's not just this coming with a checklist or our grocery list of the things we want God to do. But we listen to God through his word and by his spirit so that we know how to pray. And when we have tuned our ears to God's word and to his spirit, then we have no need to fear that God is not willing to answer those prayers. And the last line there, let us learn to give God time. We live in a microwave world, don't we? You know, one minute and dinner's ready. Not in the crock pot world. As I, you know, or, or, or better yet, smoked, pulled pork. You ever tried to rush pulled pork? It's a bad idea. Don't do it. It's like, or, or ribs? That's like chewing shoe leather if you try to rush a good rib. It takes time to get to the place where things are tender. Same thing is true with our hearts. We have to give God time as he tender, tenderizes our hearts. We persevere because we learn to trust God's timing rather than demand our own. We recognize that it's not my will, but God's will be done. You know, it's also the immature child who demands, give me, give me, give me, give me. You know, I, I don't know where that comes from. I'm pretty sure that we as parents, and probably you as parents, did not train your toddler to say, mine, 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 right? It's the immature child who says, give me, give me, give me, give me. I love it when you go in the grocery store, how they put the candy at the child's eye level, Right? My, my, no! Sometimes you as the parents have to raise their eyes up past the eye level because it's the immature child who's always saying, give me, give me, give me. And sometimes you as parents know better than your toddler what is good for them, don't you? You know, it's probably not a great idea to eat four Snickers right now. Well, I mean, let's be serious. When is it ever a bad idea to eat four Snickers? That is a bad illustration. But there are bad times. There are things you should not do. As parents, we know what often what is best for the children. Certainly God knows every time what is best for his children. God's perspective is far above ours. His way out exceeds ours. You know, we may pray for physical healing when what God wants us to pray for is spiritual healing. But we think we know what God wants. We, God, we want this person to do that. Again, listening in prayer is what God calls us to do. God doesn't call us just to bring the checklist, but to listen to him first that we might know his will and his way and his desire for the purpose, uh, for the situation. The third reason to persevere is pers- perseverance de- develops Humility. We don't persevere because we can manipulate God. We've talked about that again and again. But, but because we have nowhere else to turn, that's the issue of faith. And as our faith in God grows, we gain a better perspective of our own limitations. That's humility. In Psalm chapter 73, verse 25, it says, Whom have I in heaven but you? You have nowhere else to turn. This is why we persevere, because only God can answer prayers. It's not the manipulative prayer of look at me, look at me, but it's the, I'm looking at you, God, because you are the only option I have. We persevere in our prayer because we recognize that God is our only option. And fourth, we persevere because perseverance develops a relationship with God. Prayer is relationship. Faith is a relationship. It's not a one-way relationship of us telling God what to do. It's a two-way relationship where we hear the voice of God, we listen for the voice of God, we seek his direction, we seek his will. Your will be done, not mine. Your kingdom come, not mine. Prayer is as much about listening, in fact, it's more about listening than it is talking. We need to learn to listen, and as we pray, God draws us closer to his heart, so when we are drawn to his heart, we know better how to pray. So when you pray, it's important for us to keep an ear to heaven because that's where we learn how to pray. 
It's not meant to be this repetition of words, saying the same things over again, some sort of prayer gymnastics to manipulate God. And just a couple other things to remember. God is not bothered by your prayers. That's the picture you get from these verses in Luke that we looked at. That's like, oh, don't make me get out of bed. You know, God is not bothered by your prayers. As a child, I remember calling my mom at work. She was a nurse. And I'd call her, hi, Mom, what you doing? She'd be like, working. The message there is, leave me alone. I got things to do. At least that's the sense. I felt like I was interrupting her, like I was bothering her, which I was. But God is never bothered by your prayer. It's not like, hey, God, what are you doing? He's like, I'm busy here. I got this crisis going on over here in Africa. I'm trying to deal with If you could just leave me alone. Because sometimes we get this picture, right? You know, I'm going to save these. I'm not going to bother you, God. You know, it's just the little thing. I had the flu. Why would I bother you with the flu? I mean, that's normal, everyday thing. And sometimes we think, you know, God, I know that my marriage is rough right now, but it's just a little thing compared to the crisis going on with these wildfires or with the ISIS. You know, but God isn't put out by your prayers. God isn't bothered by you. That's the second point, is God isn't put out by you. And the sense that this is there isn't a prayer quota. It's like, all right, um, you have... 52 coins that you can use for prayer, and you've already used 49 of those, so you better be careful on how you spend the rest of your prayer coins. Sometimes we get this impression, right? We, we fail to approach God because we think the prayer request is too small, and we don't want to you know, cash in that chip, that coin, because we might need it later. You know, see, God's grace is limitless. You know, there's a, this pulling away or emptying of, of the storehouse of God's riches and his grace and his mercy. It's limitless. And God will answer your prayers, even if it's a tiny prayer, when we bring it to him, understanding that we have first sought God in prayer to say, God, how shall we pray? That we no, might know God's heart, right? His grace is limitless, limitless. His mercies are new every morning. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills which means he's got an amazing amount of resources that are at our disposal as his children when we pray to him. That's why he says, do not be anxious about anything. And that's why he says things like, consider the birds of the air, how they do not fall without him taking notice. The lilies of the field, how he takes notice of them and clothes them in their splendor. And we get anxious about these things, what we shall wear and what we shall eat and what we should do. And God says, calm down. I got this. I said, oh God, it's just, just a little food. We'll be okay. I'll just go out, get another job. I'll figure it out. And we want to do this. I got this, God. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And he's saying, no, you need to pray about that because I can. God can. God is just and he desires what is right. God is not reluctant, unwilling to come to the door when you knock. You don't have to wake up God to, and shout to get his attention. Because God knows what you need in prayer. He's waiting for you to come to him in prayer because he is a father who has this tender relationship with you. See, in the end, prayer is the humble submission to an all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And that's why we pray and that's why we persevere because it shapes us and it brings us to the place where we become more like him because we've spent time listening. When we persevere in prayer, it's a perseverance in listening to God, not talking to God. That's where we should persevere in our prayer life. Let me call your attention again. In the back of the room, as you came in, there was a giant four by eight piece of plywood back there. And uh, if you haven't been here in the last few weeks, you're going, well, that's an odd decorating choice. So let me explain to you what that is. That is a prayer wall that we're we have up for this series. If you have a prayer request, it's an opportunity for the rest of us to pray about your needs. So on the back table, there's some Sharpies. There's a number of Post-it notes. 
Uh, there's long ones, there's short ones, so just put a prayer request so that we can pray for those prayer requests. Maybe you've looked on Facebook and you've seen that in the last 21 days or the last portion, number of days that we've been through this series that we have been putting prayer requests on there. There's a way for you to pray. Go to our Facebook and, and look there and it's just some prayer prompts for you to pray. But continue to pray and continue to be part of seeking God for your own lives, that we might have revival in our own hearts and our own lives, that we might have revival here at our church in the sense that we are turning our hearts back to God and His purposes, that we might have revival in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our city, in our state, in our world. We're praying for God to make a difference. Let me tell you, when in the 1790s, shortly after the American Revolution, we went through this great moral decline. And in this moral decline, it was hard to find Christians anywhere. In fact, Harvard, which was founded as a Christian institution, did a survey of their students, and there were zero self-proclaimed Christians in that survey on their campus. Zero. Now, Princeton, which was a little bit more evangelical, also found upon, founded upon biblical principles, found two. It was the, people would say, Thomas Paine would say, that the church will, will be uh, completely irrelevant in 30 years. Heather said that... Uh, there is the moral decay of the church makes it nearly impossible to find a Christian in the church. You know, and that was the church, and the church began to pray, and they began to network, and they, they began this network of prayer, and they began to pray that God would revive their hearts, and that God would re revive the hearts of those around them. But beginning with a personal revival, they began to pray that God would change their hearts and draw them back to himself. And what happened was a thing that's called the Great Awakening, and through that revival swept across the nation. And that's, I really... I think summarizes well the heart of this 21 days of prayer is that God would begin to revive our hearts and that we would be, be seeing a revival here in our church that says, God, you are the most important. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Not mine, not my selfish interests, not my own purposes, but yours, God. So let's spend some time as we finish the message this morning just in prayer, asking God for those very things. Will you pray with me? Lord, revive us. Lord, your word is clear that your heart for us is that we would have hearts for you. Revive us. That our hearts would be aligned with your purposes. Your word tells us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So may our hearts be filled with love for you. And the second greatest commandment is that we would love our neighbors. So Lord, revive in us a heart of love for our neighbors. And we know, Lord, that we can't love others when we are judging others. So forgive us for any judgmental attitudes we may have had. We can't love others when we are critiquing others or being critical of others. So forgive us for critical spirits. And then your great commission is that we would make disciples. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for those times when we have not baptized others in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, when we have not taught others passing on to them the things the apostles passed on to us, and when we have not obeyed your word, forgive us. Revive us, Lord. It begins within us as individuals, and then corporately as a church. So as a church, we pray your forgiveness. As individuals, we pray for your forgiveness. And may we be bold enough to continue to see this revival prayed for and lived out in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.